Welcome to Talking Success, the podcast series that focuses on everything fintech. I'm your host, Darren Franks, and each week I'll be joined by a series of experts in the field who have a wealth of knowledge to share. Uh, it's time to meet this week's guest, so grab a coffee and let's start talking success. Uh, hey, everyone, and welcome back to Talking Success. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, where are we now? We're, we're Thursday afternoon, uh, just about, and uh, we've got a slightly different topic today. Uh, we, we've covered lots about payments. We've co- covered lots about digital banks. We've touched on digital lending. Uh, we've touched on crypto, um, which we'll probably touch on again. If, you, if you've listened to this, you know that I harp on about crypto uh, all the time. Um, but today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome Mark, Mark Straub, uh, all the way from London, although when he speaks, you'll realise he's not from London, um, and he hasn't got pink hair. I was a bit disappointed, I've got to be honest. I saw his his LinkedIn profile and this this kind of pink hair, well, to be fair, any hair to me is uh, is a bit of a luxury, but uh, <laughs> I was hoping he'd come on and we'd have like this bright pink sort of hairdo, uh, and I could sort of talk to him about where that came from, but I'm sure we'll get on to that. But Mark is the uh, is this founder and CEO oh, yes. of um, Smile ID. <laughs> Uh, you, you used to be called Smile Identity, um, and this is going to be all a, all around KYC, digital KYC, um, specifically in Africa. Um, and um, I'd like to have Mark with us. So this is a very, very important and topical issue that we have to talk about here. Um, we look at South Africa, we look at the grey listing here that's happened uh, the last couple of months. Um, we look at some of the other challenges across the continent. Um, and we, we're going to be talking to Mark about how companies and how fintechs Bank, digital banks, uh, lending companies, whoever it may be, who are looking to expand internationally. How do you do that when there are different requirements and regulations in each country? So um, sit back. Uh, it's going to be a, a super informative session. And uh, I'm going to stop talking and let Mark introduce himself. Um, but I want to know where the pink hair's gone, Mark. That's to start with. You know, there's a time and season for everything. Uh, and and um, nothing lasts forever, uh, even pink hair. Uh, I, uh, so, but I will, I will answer that question. Um, I'll, maybe I'll give a quick background on myself and the company, and then I'll, I'll talk about, um, how I ended up with pink hair and, uh, ultimately blonde hair at some point before it got back to my natural brown. Um, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Smile ID. We are the largest uh, provider of digital ID verification and EKYC, uh, for the African continent and markets connected to Africa. Um, we do that through a set of uh, APIs, that's Application Programmable Interfaces, and SDKs, Software Development Kits, um, but also now through no-code solutions that allow um, even uh, bank officers or staff uh, to be able to onboard and verify users um, remotely, uh, and they're able to do that uh, in a variety of ways. Um, we can verify ID numbers, we can verify faces, and we can verify documents. Um, and we do this about 3 million times a month, um, or slightly more than 100,000 times a day. Um, so we are operating at scale across the African continent, um, and we're doing this uh, with obviously a great deal of technology, but also a lot of talented people. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, let's start, first of all, in, t- in terms of coverage. Um, so which cap, well, you know, list more, how many countries in Africa, uh, given there's sort of 53, I'm not expecting you to list every single one, but uh, uh, how, how many uh, African countries do you support? Yeah, great question. We actually now have support for not only 52 markets in Africa, but we can also verify documents across the entire world. We launched this uh, last week. I'm very excited about it. So we can actually verify over 8,500 documents from over 226 countries. Um, Our core focus is, of course, the African continent. And I think one of our differentiators is that in addition to doing face recognition, in addition to doing um, uh, document verification or authenticity checks, We also integrate into government ID authorities, that is to say national ID systems. And we do that in about a half dozen markets. And there's 20 different government APIs that we can verify against. Um, So these are things like national ID numbers, in some cases, uh, driver's licenses or voter ID numbers uh, or passport um, verification APIs, as well as our face recognition software and our document uh, authenticity checks. Um, So we have a a variety of solutions, um, and I guess this is sort of, 
you know, getting to a, a topic we were talking about maybe just before the, the, the session started, you know, we, we recognize that Africa is um, not one country, as you said, it's at least 53, depending on how you count. Um, but we want to make it feel like it's one market for businesses and for developers. And so in order to do that, we've had to create solutions that are somewhat specific market by market, at the same time creating a set of tools that allows a business to integrate once and have coverage for all of Africa and now actually all of the world. That, that's massively important. I, I, I will come back to that in a second. I've, I've just got a couple of questions then. So um, in, in terms of operating in different countries from, from, from a KYC perspective, um, different regulators or different countries have different regulators and different regulations uh, around KYC, what's accepted, what's not. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you how do you go about that? So if you're looking at offering KYC in country A um, mm -hmm. and you have a, a list of requirements from uh, you know, the, the regulator in terms of what's required. Um, then you go to country B. Um, is it a case of you guys working quite closely with the regulator first to understand what those KYC requirements are? Or do you take the lead from your customer, whether that be a bank or a payments company or a fintech, et cetera? No, it, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and obviously there's not a one size fits all answer, but we do spend a, 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 an enormous amount of time first understanding what the requirements are in a given set of countries. And we've, we've tended to focus historically on the largest markets. So, you know, we have over five years of experience of dealing with regulators and regulation in markets like Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana. Um, and then we've also more recently added markets like Uganda. Um, we're doing some work now in Tanzania and Zambia. Um, and so as we built the company, we both built direct relationships with regulators and ID authorities to understand the local requirements. And then increasingly over the last really two years, we've published um, these KYC reports. Uh, and we've also started publishing actually country K kind of country profiles on our website. And so now um, between the KYC reports, which go into a great deal of depth, the country reports that we publish on our website and now even country web pages that give a high level summary we are able to give our clients or our prospects um, either a basic understanding or a very in-depth understanding of the regulatory requirements country by country. Um, and so we're just continuing down that path of building out our research um, and uh, our, our kind of knowledge base that we can make available to our customers and our prospects free of charge just as part of our service. Great. I, I will put the links actually um, with, within the, uh, the description. So if anyone wants to check those out, uh, I'll, I'll put the links below. Um, let, let's talk about some of the challenges, though. And I think, you know, um, there's a lot of talk and there has been and there will continue to be a lot of talk around financial inclusion because that's a, a big driver, uh, certainly in emerging markets and, 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 you know, Africa not being any exception to that. Um, when it comes to challenges of people having ID to be able to get KYC, whether it be for um, uh, a money transfer op operator, an MTO, whether it be for a payments company, whether it be for a bank, a digital bank, or, 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 or a, um, an incumbent bank. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the challenges around actually having ID is, is, is an issue, or, or, or is it not? Is it becoming less of an issue? It's, it's still an issue. It's, it's getting better, as you said, or, or you could say sort of becoming less of an issue, but um, it's still an issue. So the high level, um, what kind of, We'll go up to 30,000 feet and then we can go down from there. So the UN, um, about five, six years ago, when they put out a report on the state of identity uh, across the world, um, they, they suggested that there were somewhere around a billion people that had no form of ID or could not prove their identity in, in sort of a, by any means, you know, with physical or digital. And that about half of those people lived in the African continent. So let's just say 500 million. We know Africa's population today is about 1.45 billion, so um, almost one and a half billion. And we know it's expanding um, by about 50 to 60 million people every two years. Um, and we've been at this business now for six years. So um, we estimate that about a third of, of Africans have no formal uh, identity credential. That does mean that there is a, a billion identity credentials out there at least, or a billion people with identity credentials of some kind. And so obviously that's where we started with from when building our service. 
but we do have tools that our clients can use and our clients range from banks to fintechs to ride sharing companies, even dating apps. Um, but we now have a set of tools um, that can be used not only for verifying IDs themselves, whether uh, in a, the form of, a, of a, a number or a document, but also the ability to just verify faces of people or even deduplicate faces of people, even if they don't have any form of identity credential. Um, and that is most useful in certain countries that are lower income, uh, certain countries that don't have much infrastructure, but where there is still economic activity going on, often um, public sector activity, sometimes grants or, um, or government programs. And so we have uh, spent some time providing those kinds of solutions that actually have no identity credential. It's just purely using face recognition and liveness detection. Um, so yeah, it's still a problem, but I will say some, maybe just some, like some highlights of things that have changed over the last five, six years since we started and, and also um, maybe some really hopeful things. So one is we are seeing increasing investment in what are called foundational ID systems by countries. In some cases, countries that already had legacy ID systems like Kenya uh, and Uganda, but they're building new digital ID systems that are comprehensive and that connect to public services. In other cases, entirely new ID systems like Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is actually building its first national ID system for the first real time. Previously, they had like local IDs that were mostly handwritten. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing this, this set of trends, and I think that bodes very well for solving the problem that the UN pointed out, you know, five years ago. Okay, all right. Let's, um, let's move on to the tech part of this, because um, I'm a bit of a techie at heart, Mark, so I, I, I love talking tech, right? Um, I'm not gonna start talking coding languages, right? Well, this is very much- Yeah, <laughs> you're talking um, about Python, if you want. I, I remember um, the first ever time I did EKYC, and I, I, and I won't ever forget this, um, we're going back, over 10 years, easily, uh, probably 13 mm -hmm. years. And I registered on this uh, this app called uh, Airbnb, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time that I'd ever gone through a digital KYC process. And yes. I was blown away. I remember it. I remember that. I thought, this is unbelievable. Like, how does this work? Um, it was, mm -hmm. you know, scan, scan your face, scan your, scan your passport uh, or driving license. I was in the UK. Uploads took, I think, a day or maybe shorter and then i got you know the verification tick um now yeah. how has technology evolved obviously 13 years ago to now in technology terms is like you know 100 years maybe even more um how have things developed or emerged from a technology perspective um then i want to come on to uh, another topic which is very close to my heart which is uh, ai and deep fakes and things like that right so we'll come on to yep. that in a minute but l let's talk about the evolution how, how have things changed from then to now yeah so if you want to think about um, identity, I think of it, 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 sometimes the U.S. is a good um, reference point for understanding what's happened before, because there's a lot of history uh, and legacy investment that's happened in that market. And then you can use that as a, as a comparison to say, well, what's going on today and maybe more dynamic or emerging markets, whether in Asia or in Africa. Um, many people don't think about identity as a sector, um, because usually identity is a, is a concept that's tied to some other sector, um, telecom, mm -hmm. uh, maybe financial history, credit bureaus, et cetera. But if you really want to think about, I have this slide that I, that I talk about in, um, in, in some of the presentations that we give. And I'll see if I can, maybe I can share a link to it afterwards and you can put it up in your, in your post. Basically, it's a map of the United States and, and uh, part of Europe. And the slide lays out that, that this part of the world, the West, has had 50 years of companies aggregating and verifying data. Companies like LexisNexis, White Pages, uh, Bloomberg and Financial Data, Thomson Reuters, Dun & Bradstreet for company data. And then actually, as you think about consumer credit data, that's really where... where identity began, began to become important. So like TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, those businesses really got started in the 1970s and 80s. That's when they really grew. Um, and, and it was with the rise of the credit card industry and, and you know consumer credit. 
Um, so we've had generations of companies in the U.S. that have built identity infrastructure and largely unregulated. You know, there's no data privacy or protection laws at a federal level in the U.S. There's a few states that have it. Um, but there's been enormous investment in that kind of infrastructure in those markets, and it's taken you know 50 years. Most people didn't really think about digital identity until, as you described, they, they signed up for Uber for the first time or they signed up for Airbnb. And this really happened with the rise of the iPhone and smartphones and people having mobile internet. So now you got a computer in your pocket, it's connected to the internet. You can go out there and have real world experiences, but those experiences put you in situations where trust and safety is really important. And so those companies, Airbnb, you know, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, they had to figure out how to ensure that the real world interactions that they were facilitating remain safe. And when you start doing things at scale, you know, you can imagine if you start serving a million people or 10 million or 100 million people, like you're going to get every, you know, every slice of the population, including people who may not have the same view of trust and safety that you and I do. Yeah. Um, and so you have to start instituting policies and rules. And one of the things that came about was this concept of, you know, digital KYC or basically um, sharing your personal information in a mobile app or on a website, usually tied to an ID document and your face. And that became, you know, a very common use case for digital ID or, or KYC for the shared economy. Um, but, you know, remember before that all happened, you had companies like LexisNexis and White Pages and Bloomberg and TransUnion all collecting consumer data and, and verifying consumer data for decades. So what really changed is the, the use of images, selfies and pictures of documents and doing that dynamically quickly on your phone and then getting a very fast response. Um, I would say there's now kind of a, a third wave of that. So if, if the first wave was all this kind of text-based stuff, the second wave was um, you know, taking a picture of, uh, um, so when I say text-based stuff, I mean kind of private companies collecting um, generic um, kind of information to verify on consumers like your social security number or your ID number. Uh, your credit history. The second wave was these documents and selfies. The third wave, which I think we're really seeing now, is when you start combining these things with some national ID API. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've seen in Asia. There's been a leapfrog effect where in some countries, instead of actually issuing physical credentials, countries are issuing biometric national ID numbers. And so a consumer or a citizen can share their ID number and maybe take a selfie or put down their thumb and verify their identity in order to get a SIM or in order to get a loan. And so what we're seeing now across Africa to kind of bring it back to your, your listener base is many countries in Africa have looked at um, the West, they've looked at the East and they've said, let's pick a set of solutions that makes the most sense for us and is the most cost effective. And a lot of countries are looking at India as an example to learn from. So India built this national ID system about eight, nine years ago. It's called Aadhaar, which means foundation in Hindi. And really what it is, is it's an ID system that's predicated on the idea that everyone should be included, um, but also that technology will evolve. And so the form factors for verification will evolve over time as well. The other key thing about Aadhaar is that based on some Supreme Court decisions in India, you're not required to register for Aadhaar. So it's not forced upon people anymore, at least like it was kind of in the early days. And I think that's an important distinction. But the idea is that because they've built a system that works incredibly well, that has very high uptime, and that is technology, um, uh, future compatible, um, there's a lot of use cases for Aadhaar, which means there's a lot of adoption for Aadhaar. And, and that means that people can um, use it for uh, getting bank accounts, they can use it for getting loans, they can use it for um, paying for school fees or registering their children, et cetera, getting SIM cards. Um, and the way that we're seeing this play out in Africa now is countries are trying to replicate some of the things that India did. They're building it for their own use cases. They're focusing on getting people registered as opposed to focusing on issuing a physical document all the time. And once they get people registered, they're trying to figure out multiple ways that they can authenticate them. So yes, maybe there's a physical document that you can look at or inspect, but that may not be the only way you can authenticate. You could also authenticate um, by uh, maybe an OTP to a phone number that's tied to that ID number, or you could authenticate the way we try to do it, which is 
taking a selfie and matching that that selfie to the photo on file inside the government database. And that's a very powerful form of authentication. It allows people to authenticate remotely from wherever they are with the device they've got in their pocket. And that's really the, the future that we're helping to bring about. Great. Um, okay. The, 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 I've got loads of questions, but um, I, yeah. I, I'll, try and, I'll try and cherry pick them because I appreciate you having got all day. Um, let's talk about uh, the emergence of AI um, mm -hmm. for, not for good, but actually for, uh, you know, that's a very small percent of the population who are trying to, you know, cut corners and defraud, uh, of which yep. there are, you know, synthetic IDs have been something that, you know, has been around and is still around. Um, although I think those numbers have, have, have come down considerably over the last few years. Um, when it comes to verifying someone based on a selfie, um, sort of how many data points do you look at? And is there a difference between me having sort of a, a deep fake um, or I can go and get an image of you and I can put it on my, you know, my screen and I can use some sort of AI tool to make it 3D and then I can hold my phone up against my screen and mm -hmm. uh, sort of take a picture of that. I, I, yeah. I, is, this, is this foolproof? I mean, is this 100% or are we talking a little bit less than that? There's always going to be some slippage or how does that yeah. work? Yeah. Well, it's always, you got to be careful when, when in technology, whenever you're, you're talking about absolutes, um, because technology is always evolving and dynamic. And the same tools that, um, remember, the same tools that fraudsters can use to create, you know, generative AI or generative adversarial attacks, um, you know, the good guys can also use those tools to try to catch those attacks, right? So it's an arms race, and it works both ways. Um, and it's really a question of who throws more firepower at the problem and how quickly you get to um, you get to answers or how quickly you catch things as 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 technology changes and as uh, attacks change. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we see today, and then I'll talk about what we expect to see more of in the future, because I think those are different. Sure. Most of what we see today is still what I would call very unsophisticated fraud. So people typing in ID numbers that aren't real, and then we basically can verify that it's not a real ID number because we can just check it against a government database. Um, or people um, trying to upload a photo of a photo, as you said, like I'm going to take a picture of something, take a picture of a screen, or I'm going to try to upload a, a frame that I got from somebody's Facebook account, but it's actually not live in this image. So that's kind of the mo most of the more common fraud we see. That stuff is relatively easy for us to catch. And, you know, we do it every day, thousands of times a day. Um, and keep in mind that like, like most criminals, most fraudsters are looking for the unlocked door. And so they're checking doors to see if they can find one that's unlocked. And, and so if you think about this, if you think about a neighborhood, you know, a criminal may come to a neighborhood and they're looking for the one door that's unlocked. And if you've got better locks than everybody else, you're probably safe. But if you don't have any locks, you're probably the one that's going to get hit. Um, so a lot of that still happens in the markets where we operate. It's the guys who, it's the companies that didn't invest in security. They didn't do digital onboarding. They didn't, they didn't take, they're not checking biometrics. They're not checking for duplicates. They're not doing liveness tests. Those basic things, which we provide today and which we've provided for five years, you know, that's going to catch more than half the fraud and probably 90 plus percent of the fraud, at least that we see today. Um, so we mostly just encourage people like do the basics, you know, use a KYC provider. If you don't use us, use somebody else. Um, at the appropriate risk level, ask for selfies, do biometrics, do liveness checks. Um, and then the second level of degree of fraud we see is what I call duplicate fraud. So that's where it is a real person showing up. It is a real face. It is a real selfie, but the same person is managing to register themselves multiple times for your service. And they may be doing that because you've created some incentive for them to do that. You've given out a referral fee, you're giving out loans, you might be giving out some kind of free credit. As a result, there's an incentive to sign up for your platform multiple times. And so people will find ways to do that under what looks like a legitimate credential multiple times, and then you'll approve them. There is one way to catch this, that it's using face deduplication. So that means that every time somebody signs up for your service, even if it's with a different credential, if you are in real time checking that new incoming face against other faces that you've registered or if a set of known bad actors that you've registered, then you can catch those faces in the moment and stop them from signing up 
the second time or the fifth time or the 80th time. You know, we've seen attempts sometimes as much as 80 times. Um, we have a tool that does that. It's called Smile Secure. It's a real-time inline face deduplication engine. There are some other companies that do similar things, but that's a really powerful tool for catching this sort of what I'd call kind of like not basic fraud, but slightly more sophisticated fraud. Now we come to the third tier, which is kind of the future stuff. And that's generative AI, synthetic fakes, deep fakes. And that's the stuff that I think we're going to see more and more of in Africa. Of course, um, many lending companies have seen a lot of this in the last year or two in the US, but we're now just probably at the dawn of seeing it in markets like Africa. Um, so there's a few ways that we can stop this. One of the ways is by checking against government databases. And so while synthetic ID fraud may work well in a situation where you're just taking a picture of a face and a document, and if you've been able to somehow, you know, get a real document or um, put that synthetic face on the document and create a fraudulent document, you know, now the, the computers and the humans are trying to analyze images alone. Um, and in order to make sure that that face matches and in order to make sure it's a real face. Um, but if you're also checking against a government database, which we can do in a lot of markets, especially in the big markets, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, if you're also checking a government database, then that fraudster would have had to both send you a selfie, real or generative. The selfie would have to pass a liveness check, which is hard for synthetics. Mm, it's easy for real people, but hard for synthetics. And they would have to figure out how to get that face inserted into a government database, which is much harder yeah. <laughs> because now you've actually either got to somehow break into the database, which is usually not that easy, or you have to do some sort of um, social engineering to get somebody inside the government to let you register that face, which we have seen happen, but it's hard yeah. to do that at scale. Yeah, It's hard to get, you know, 10,000 fake faces entered into government databases. Um, and so... Um, the way we attack this is this multi-pronged approach. Um, so it's like having multiple locks that are of different sizes, shape, and method. And the first is uh, we encourage people to, to uh, ask their users to take a selfie. We match that selfie against, let's say, a document or a government uh, data source. We would encourage and use liveness checks. We would encourage and use face deduplication to make sure it's not a real person trying to get in multiple times. And the third is we would check that face against a government data source to make sure that the selfie that's being provided actually matches somebody who registered in person six months ago, a year ago, six years ago. That combination of checks um, with periodic human review whenever our machines detect that there might be something that looks off is pretty effective. Yes, there will be individuals that get through. Yes, there will be occasionally um, somebody who's able to, to get a fake through, but it is very difficult to attack at scale. So if you want to basically try to steal a million dollars by getting, you know, a thousand fraudsters through, that's not going to happen uh, with, with, you know, if you put four or five different kinds of checks in place. Um, that's incredibly difficult to do at scale. So I think that's what we spent a lot of time thinking about. I mean, obviously we, we investigate and we human review checks thousands of times every day. We always feed that back into our, um, our algorithms and back into our processes and policies. We see new types of attacks all the time. Um, but uh, we try to make sure that, that um, people can't take down your business by attacking you a thousand or, or 10,000 times uh, at scale. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I suppose the other question I've got, one of the many questions I've got is um, around data sovereignty, and that, that, that's a that's a big thing mm -hmm. in Africa. Um, lots of countries, South Africa is being one of those. Um, you know, requires you know ID, personal IDs, to be um, uh, domiciled in the country. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes, it can be on a cloud server as long as the cloud is hosted or the physical server is is on soil. Um, is that a challenge for when you are rolling out into new markets? Um, and you're obviously trying to aggregate data as well. And you might have someone, say, from Uganda who then wants to go to live in Kenya or wants to go and live in Nigeria or South Africa. Um, are you able to kind of move around with their ID or would they need to go and set up a whole new sort of process in, in, in the country they choose to go and live in? Yeah, t today it's the latter. Um, but I'll explain yeah. a little bit more about why. Um, mostly it's for, for privacy reasons and data protection reasons. And it goes back to the first point you're making, which is, well, what, is the, what, are the, what do the laws say in each country? What we have found is many countries in Africa have now passed their own 
data privacy or data protection laws. Those laws mirror many of the components of GDPR, which is the European Union's uh, general data privacy um, regulation. And that regulation sets out a concept of data controllers and data processors. Now, pardon me, we're going to dive into like legal um, legalese here for just a moment, but it's worth understanding this. So a data controller is a business that you as a consumer have a relationship with and you have given them permission to do stuff with your data. And if they want to do things with your data um, that you haven't given them permission for, they're supposed to come back and ask you, or those things have to be very specific uh, exceptions approved under law, national security in some cases, public safety and a few others. Um, the, the, the second concept besides the controller is the processor. And so that is a company that's usually providing services to those consumer brands or those consumer companies. So we are a data processor. We don't mm -hmm. sign terms and conditions with individual consumers directly. Yep. What that means is that we have to abide by the rules that our clients and we agree on. So we will contract with a FinTech, a lender, a payments company, uh, maybe a bank or a telco. The bank or telco will have terms and conditions that the consumer signs up for. One of those is that that they may share data with Smile ID, and we may process that data. What we don't do is we don't indefinitely hold that data or move it around or manipulate it for our own purposes in a undefined and indefinite way. We will typically have a data retention period that we put in place, and we usually use the, the 90 days as a default. And then we will delete that data unless our client, unless the, the bank or the telco asks us to retain it for longer or unless a government asks us to retain it for longer because they want to uh, see the data for some um, enforcement action. And so what that means is that we are typically doing work on behalf of our clients, banks, fintechs, telcos, et cetera. We're providing them results. Sometimes it's a verification. Sometimes it's a, this face doesn't match. Sometimes it's this name came up on a sanctions list. And then at the appropriate time, 90 days in, or in some cases, 180 days or 360 days in, we're deleting that data. We will still have a record that the transaction took place. So there's abil ability for someone to audit and say, wait, how many transactions did you do? And were they verified or not verified? And could the bank go back and reverse it and compare it with their data? Yes, we have an audit trail that this happened, but we won't necessarily store that this was Darren and he was born, you know, whatever, 1972. Apple, and Apple, uh, Apple, this yeah, is was the wrong thing, 1972. <laughs> Wow. I don't know. I was, I was picking. I, like you, my brother I was really trying to like you, and then you came out with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I uh, should. How about eighty-two? Is that better? Let's go with eighty-two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's much better. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, I was born eighty-one. Um, okay. So, so my point is that that rather than retaining all that data indefinitely and sort of creating a treasure trove that is attractive to hackers, we're basically regularly purging that data, and we're doing it on a on a dynamic basis per the agreements between us and the data controller. And um, occasionally there are times when we may retain data for longer and it's usually tied back to, again, some very specific purpose that we've laid out with that client of ours, which again needs to be shared with the in, in consumer. Um, so that is sort of how data protection works, both in Europe, but actually in many countries in Africa. And then there's slight nuances in Kenya, obviously in Ni Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, et cetera, but they all generally follow that formula. Um, I think um, the, where we're going with this, where I see things going is a few years ago when the blockchain really got going, people started seeing more and more use cases for it besides just speculation. There was this idea of you could use a blockchain as a, an identity bureau or an identity database. And people started really getting excited about the idea of self-sovereign identity. So can I store my identity credentials in my own digital wallet, whether online or offline? Can I selectively permission who I give that to and who I don't give that to? That's a really neat concept, but it doesn't work unless you have clearly defined protocols that everyone uses, right? So if like, if, if Visa's on one standard and MasterCard's on another and Google's on another and Facebook's on another and Apple's on another, like, Having a self-sovereign identity doesn't, it's like, it's not very useful. It's like, it's like if you created your own, as a great example, I think there, I live, now I live in the UK, there's some islands like off the coast of the UK where people have like declared that that little island is its own nation. And, yeah. uh, you know, they print their own little passport and there's like two people that live on the island. 
Well, that may be all fine and well. They've got their own passport. They live on an island, but they're on an island. If they want to travel anywhere, that passport's not accepted. It doesn't work as a credential for all the things you want to be able to do. You want to go see the Eiffel Tower, you need you need to cross the border. Um, yeah. You want to go open up a bank account in South Africa, you get across the border. So you need something that that makes sense in the context of the rest of the systems. What I have increasingly heard about, and I think there are companies now pursuing this, is the idea of actually creating a standard, ha- probably having one of the large or multiple large businesses work together to create an open standard that would allow other companies to plug into it. It wouldn't necessarily be self-sovereign identity, but it might be the idea that there's a set of a, a set of standards that um, the consumer could, let's say, open up an account with any company that joins those standards, and then the consumer could either permission or retract that information. And if other companies are all joining in on that standard, then the information is only shared as and when the consumer is giving that permission. So it is like another, you know, another form of internet. But the idea you could hear, you could use a blockchain here because you could basically have um, an ability for it, a blockchain is just it's just a database that multiple people can read and write to. That's all it really is. Um, And so if you have a database that has read and write capabilities, but you can have many different entities that are allowed to be on that database, then it's just a question of who's allowed to read and who's allowed to write. And so you'd probably start small with, you know, maybe a dozen companies that are key stakeholders in creating that new standard and have the ability to read and write. And as the use cases grow and adoption grows by those companies' consumers, now you actually start creating a standard. I think that this is going to happen. I think it's going to happen in the next five years. I think there will be probably multiple attempts to make this happen, but I can imagine companies like leading companies like, like one of the major payments companies or an Apple you know, or Google could pursue this kind of an initiative. Um, Apple tends to keep everything closed inside their network, so they may not pursue this. I don't have any inside information. I'm just speculating. But I would imagine that that's how we go from kind of, I have to do this KYC process every time that I move or every time I open up a new account to I have some sort of credential. It's stored in my phone and I can permission it to any other company that's on this like network. Right now we do that with our Gmail, like open ID or Facebook, you know, Facebook ID. But I imagine that there'd be some standard that multiple companies could write to that would allow you as a consumer to do the same thing. And it wouldn't be tied to just one company. It wouldn't just be Google. It might be, you know, the standard works across a dozen or two dozen or 200 companies. So that's, that's uh, potentially the future. I think it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I think it's going to happen. I, I just, because there's enough, yeah. because nobody, no, no one ever wants to have everything locked into one company forever. I think there's always going to be this desire to have some flexibility, but there has to be, you have to get together a coalition of companies to make that happen. And the companies have to be strong enough. It can't just be 12 startups. Like you've got to have at least one or two kind of market makers who can help create that, uh, foster that ecosystem. I just want to co- cover two things before we go. Um, so I appreciate I've kept you nearly an hour. So uh, uh, I, hope, I hope your listeners find this interesting. <laughs> I hope they're well, still. Well, with- will. Make, we, we make sure they do. Okay, yeah, we absolutely. Um, so, Mark, I, I, when it comes to um, the deployment of Smile ID. Uh, mm-hmm. For within a client, um, am I correct in saying this is like an embedded solution? So um, a, uh, a a user would go on to a bank or to a payments company, they would register, they would then go to authorize it, and it it launches within the bank or within the, the fintech's application, rather than sort of having them having to download a Smile ID app or anything like that. Is is that how it works? That's how it works today. I'm really excited to say we've actually so yes, we have SDKs and and developer tools that would plug into our clients' applications. So the consumer is yeah. really staying within the bank's experience or the lender's experience. Occasionally we may have a screen that we surface and that screen has some components that we've created that are good for image capture or good for um, ensuring that you're getting the correct consumer details or even we've actually created sample consent screens so that our clients, they wanna launch in Nigeria but they don't know all the Nigerian regs and regulations. Like we know that stuff. We can give you a consent screen that actually follows the law. So you don't have to go read the law and spend all the time talking to lawyers like we did. Um, but um, where we're going and where we've actually just launched, we've launched a new product called Smile Links. Smile Links works like any other internet link that you can create, like a bit.ly link or a tiny URL link. So if you are a, if you are a customer of Smile ID, if you're a, a you know, again, if you're a bank, a lender, a fintech, uh, a ride sharing app, whatever, 
you even even health insurance companies uh, can do this. You go into the portal that you have access to, the enterprise portal, and instead of having to go to the developer tools and write a bunch of code to embed this stuff into your application, you just click on this thing called Smile Links, and it's like a it's like a very simple web page where um, you can select the countries that you want to accept identity credentials from. Then within that country, you can select which credentials you want to accept. Okay, so uh, South Africa, I want to accept the national ID and the green book. I don't want to accept driver's licenses because that doesn't work for whatever it is I'm doing. Maybe I'm doing crypto. Um, and then um, you can then select which verification method you want to use. We have uh, three different verification methods. One is we're, we're just verifying an ID number. Another is we're verifying an ID number and the document. And the third might be we're verifying um, an ID number of face and the document against the, against the uh, national ID system. So some of those methods include biometrics, other ones don't. So you can choose that. You choose the country, you choose the ID type, you choose the method of verification. Then you click create. Boom, you get a link and a QR code. You can send that link and QR code to your consumers. You can do that over email through your your company's email system. You can do that over WhatsApp if you're running a WhatsApp campaign. Um, but the point is now, without writing any code today, you could go set up a KYC flow and you could send that out to your user base and get started literally in like two minutes. And so this radically reduces the cost of integration and launching an app um, and, and launching an onboarding process. You don't need mobile developers. You don't even need developers. Um, so we're really excited about this. It's called Smile Links. It's going to totally change the way that, that companies get started. Because it used to be that you have to not only sign a contract and you got to do a bunch of preparing work, and then you got to do like two sprint cycles to get everything integrated. Now you can literally do this in two minutes. Um, and so I'm really excited about this. It also allows companies that don't have large IT departments or large developer teams to get started today. So maybe you're running an agent network in Tanzania or in Kenya, you need to onboard agents or you need to onboard consumers. You know, you can go create a bunch of links, onboard those consumers like starting this weekend. Um, right. So Smile Links they're, they're is the sort of product. Mark, they're, they're, they're sort of personalized links, are they? So um, the, 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 there's some data that will be sort of pre-filled when you click on the link, it's got your like your name or whatever it may be. Great, great question. You can, there's two options. So I didn't mention this, but you can toggle to a single use link or a multi-use link. So a single use link would be like, I'm going to onboard Darren. Maybe I've hired Darren. He's going to be an agent for me. He's going to, you know, um, sell insurance in uh, Nairobi, uh, or I know you're in South Africa, so maybe he's going to sell insurance, uh, um, let's say in Joburg. And I'm going to send Darren this link, and I've created a custom link for Darren that is only South Africa and only these ID types, and he has to do this kind of method. And I'm going to send that out as a single use link. So once Darren clicks on it, the link and completes the process, like that link is done, it goes dead. You can also, you can toggle over to do what's called a multi-use link. A multi-use link would be like, I'm going to create a lending application. That lending application is gonna be sent out, you know, in this set of channels. And we may get 500 people that sign up, we may get 5,000 people that sign up. That, that multi-use link can be used over and over and over again. And in that multi-use link, you may decide, I'm willing to accept people from Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Togo and Benin. And, you know, for Ghana, I'll accept these three credentials. For Nigeria, I'll accept these five. For Togo, it's only these two. For Benin, it's these two. And now you can send that out. So it's, it's, you have the flexibility. Literally, you're clicking on, you know, three, four buttons and you've got a, and also it's, the link's not, not only a link, you also get a QR code. So if you want to send out a QR code to somebody because you think that's going to be an easier way to display it, um, you can do that too. So yeah, it's a totally new way of getting started with KYC. Eventually, people may decide, hey, look, we're really scaling. We're launching mobile apps. We want to move to a deep, deep integration. You can always do that. But if you if you want to get started and, and kind of not have to wait or suffer through the pain of you know mobile integration, now you can get started literally in a couple of minutes. And, and those links are like more, uh, sort of dual branded, are they? So they've got the customers kind of logos yes. on them and it talks about that. So it doesn't, it doesn't come necessarily from Smile ID. It comes well, from- it, it, it does come from, so just be clear, when we, when we, so that's a fully hosted solution that we launched. So it is a Smile ID uh, a link. So you're sending a yeah. consumer to a web page that we host that Smile ID controls and hosts, but it's co-branded with your business. So, you know, if you're doing this from a certain bank or from a certain yeah. company, you can, you can uh, add those logos. And, and obviously you can also customize the messaging 
you can tell the consumer, you know, hey, sure. this is what you're doing. This is why you're doing this. Is what's going to happen next? Well, listen, I think it's a, it's a fantastic product for, you know, for early stage startups um, who are, you know, maybe a POC or maybe they're in a sandbox environment or maybe they're just starting to go live, um, need a KYC solution perhaps don't have the budgets to start deeply embedding something um, or don't have the time, um, you know, if they can just plug in and, you know, create a link, um, hey, that's uh, that's a big headache taken out, right? Uh, and they don't have the compliance headache either. That's absolutely right. I'd say one more thing, which is if, you're, if your listeners uh, are running startups or running companies and they want to try this out, uh, if they message us um, through any of the channels or if they get in touch with you directly and they let, they let us know that they heard about us through the Talking Success uh, podcast, we're happy to extend a hundred dollars worth of free credit so they can get started. Oh, wow. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, we will make sure that uh, we publish that and uh, get as many people as we can kind of on board. It sounds, honestly, it, it sounds great. I, and by the way, everyone, I, I didn't know about this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I wasn't aware of that. so no, Mark, listen, that, that's super, super cool. Uh, I, I was going to sort of say, you know, how do people get in touch with you? But I think you just kind of uh, uh, touched on that. Um, so X, because we can't call it Twitter anymore. Uh, yeah. LinkedIn. Um, yeah, know. so, it's, so uh, it's, it's usesmileid.com. That's our website. Okay. You can also find us on X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and uh, our profile is also uh, usesmileid. Um, and you can find me online as well. I've been on Twitter since I think, I think I've been on there since like 2007. Um, so I'm Mark Straub. Uh, uh, on, on what Mark, I'm, I'm Twitter slash X slash Elon Musk's c company, however you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Listen, I'm going to put all the links um, to the bottom of, of, of this. Um, and as, as Mark's kindly said, if anyone uh, reaches out to, to him or to the team at Smile, uh, Smile ID, and they mentioned that you heard this on, on Talking Success, then uh, you get a uh, $100 worth of credits to uh, to play around with, which I think is very, very generous. Um, that's right. So thank you. Thank you. you have to onboard and make sure that you complete our, our KYC process because we need to make sure you're a real company. But uh, once you go through that, uh, it's pretty easy to give you credits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think you've got to try it out anyway, right, to see what you're buying. So uh, so that makes sense. Uh, listen, Mark, I, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know you're in London. I know you're, uh, you're busy with uh, you, a lot of money uh, that you've raised as well. So spending that must be a hard job. Mark. <laughs> well, try, try um, to make sure we don't spend too much of it and making sure we're actually delivering for our customers. I think everyone's well, trying to discuss it here. Um, however, we have missed something, I'm afraid. And... Uh, you started off by telling us you're going to tell us the yes. story of the pink hair and you'd never got around to it. So I'm not going to let you go until that's uh, until you've divulged everything. Right. Where did it come from? Mark? Come on. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> About a year ago, a little more than, um, you know, we were on one of our all hands calls and I was really pushing the team on a particular metric. And uh, we use something called OKRs, like uh, mm -hmm. objective objectives and key results. Um, and, I said to the team, if they hit their OKRs, uh, I would dare my hair pink. And I did it because one of our team members actually had like a streak of pink hair. And so that's sort of how the idea came to me. I was just looking at her profile and I thought, hey, there's like an idea. And it's pretty outside of my, I don't know, for people who know me, it's like a very, it's not something I would traditionally do. <laughs> so uh, I kind of said it in jest and I really, I, I only thought there, I didn't really think it was probably going to happen, but but then it actually happened uh, at the end of the quarter and things were really going well. And we had an all hands uh, offsite coming up in Kenya. So the night that everybody arrived, I decided to make my way down to um, uh, the Yaya Center, which is a little shopping center yeah. in Nairobi. And I went um, to uh, this little barber shop in there and they did an amazing job. And first they bleached my hair because you got to get it like basically almost like golden white, I don't know how to describe it, like Billy Idol to basically make it, so because my hair is kind of dark, it's brown for those who are listening. And then you got, and then you put the dye in and the dye was called Manic Panic. And it was given to me by one of our teammates. And uh, yeah, it took about two and a half, three hours. Um, and then when I showed up at dinner, I, I mean, I, I looked like I was a popsicle of some kind. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can see what it looked like. You can go to LinkedIn page. Uh, of course, yeah, now it's been a year, so it's, it's the dye's gone away and the bleach has gone out. Yeah, well, people won't need to go onto LinkedIn because I'm going to make sure I embed that picture uh, on here as we start talking about that. So people already know what you look like from LinkedIn, um, and they're going <laughs> to see it here now as well. So, uh, so now that listen, I think that's a that's a great way of being, uh, you know, part of the part of the team and uh, you know, keeping your word. Um, 
I wish I could dip down my hair pink, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So it might, might be the beard. Um, but listen, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so very much. Um, as I said, loads, loads of links going to go in the description. If anyone wants to reach out to Mark, uh, you'll know where to find him. Um, we're back uh, next week uh, with, a, with another episode, uh, a very exciting one as well. So uh, keep tuned. Uh, Mark, thank you. And uh, we'll speak again soon. Thanks, Darren. This has been fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for a great conversation. I hope uh, people enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Cheers. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Talking Success. Thank you so much for tuning in.